So welcome to today's panel, uh, The State of Cloud Native Business Value 2024. Uh, thanks for joining us. I'm Catherine Paganini. I'm the head of marketing at Buoyant, the creator of Linkerd, and I'm also the co-chair of the TAG Contributor Strategy. And I'm joined by a great panel today, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Do you want to start? Sounds good. Oh, it is on. Good. Um, <laughs> hi, my name is Colin Griffin. Um, I'm the founder of a company here called Crumware. Also, I'm the co-chair, uh, or a co-chair of the Platform Engineering Working Group. And I'm Danielle. I work at StackGen, an infrastructure from code company. Um, I am a co-chair of the Cartographist Working Group, a CNCF ambassador, and super happy to be here. Uh, I'm Simon Forster, and I'm an independent technical architect. I uh, work in financial services in the city of London. I'm an ambassador, along with Danielle, and also a co-chair of the Cartographos Working Group. Uh, my name is Robbie Glenn. I'm CEO of Glenium. Uh, I'm also a cloud architect and a founder of the Cartographos Working Group. Okay, so let's start with the question. What is the state of cloud native? business value 2024, and how are advancements in things like operations, time to market, resource utilization, contributing to the expected growth and innovation? Um, Danielle, do you want to take that one? Yes. So um, we are seeing that we are still struggling as a group to communicate the value of cloud native technology. So all of you are technologists in this room doing really cool things, um, but trying to explain exactly why we need this tech and how it impacts the business and revenue and reducing risk and whatnot becomes harder um, when you're talking to the C-level and, and you know, the board members or the higher ups in your organization. So we wanted to dig it a little bit deeper into this, and we did the survey, which was up here, and kind of, I, I didn't memorize all the numbers, so I'm gonna read a few. We're seeing that, you know, 20% of, of people who responded in our kind of preliminary results of the survey, they're saying, yeah, cloud native is cool, but we're, uh, we're, we're only, you know, we're not as strategic as we should be, and we're not talking that business voice. We have 70% say that there's a lack of skills and expertise, like it's limited to average. So, you know, it's great that we're all here at KubeCon getting upskilling and all of that. 60% um, say they need more resources, which becomes really important with the business value because you need to communicate that in order to actually get the business value. Um, and 60% of respondents say it's hard to measure the success of cloud native. And so when you're thinking about business value and cloud native, that's an essential part of what you're doing. How do you measure success and demonstrate it up your organization? Yeah, um, and what are like the biggest risks and benefits of adopting cloud native and how can organizations um, overcome the risks? Um, I don't know, do you wanna go ahead? Sure. Um, so I think some of the biggest benefits are probably pretty obvious. It's uh, rapid experimentation, um, you know, feedback. Um, you know, there's, I think, a major benefit that it's bringing a lot of uh, other technologies. Like, uh, you'd be surprised at how many teams are only recently benefiting from source control. Um, it's pretty scary, but it's true. And so having cloud native, uh, you know, invade, I guess, a, a organization requires them to take on all of these technologies and really invest in them. Uh, I think some of the biggest risks are just not taking, um, uh, you know, being aware of, of all of the other aspects. You know, something that we talk about a lot at Cartographos is not only the technology, but also the people, process, policy, um, those kind of uh, aspects that are sometimes forgotten or, or, you know, kind of after the fact, thought of after the fact. Um, and, you know, some of the major risks are, are really just expecting things to be a silver bullet, you know, immediate ROI. Um, as Danielle mentioned, you know, this is hard to measure what, what the new, you know, what KPIs really should be. Um, there's also some sticker shock sometimes as we move from CapEx to OpEx, um, you know, that can, can be mitigated by things like FinOps and really just understanding who's, you know, who, how we're uh, attributing uh, uh, costs back to the actual teams. Probably some additional points I'd raise around the um, risk side of it is particularly with regulated industries um, such as finance, healthcare, there'll be strong regulatory presence there. 
We want to, um, a business will often um, be tracking, obviously, fines or other measures of um, failures. So if we're, if we're carefully looking at our investment in cloud native and also looking at the types of risks that the business is running, if we can see a decrease due to, for example, effective scaling, additional resilience, and other non-functional capabilities that cloud native provides us, that's a really interesting place to look at. A really great way to, to make your boss happy is to not be out of the market. Okay, and now uh, a very important question that I assume everyone here is interested in. So how do you measure ROI and what metrics should companies focus on? Colin? Oh goodness, the <laughs> ROI question. Oh, I, you know, I, I think there's a big pitfall when it comes to ROI uh, that we are observing in the industry. And especially when uh, these cloud native technologies are, are difficult to understand by non-technical folks, right? And they are perceived as, well, obviously it's the next generation, it's this magic bullet. So when can you show me ROI now that we're doing some Kubernetes things or cloud native things or um, you know, usually the business stakeholders have trouble even pronouncing Kubernetes. So if you have trouble, if we have trouble getting you to understand how to say Kubernetes, how am I going to communicate ROI? But uh, still in cloud native, we have a major challenge with these organizations where they, they don't yet understand the challenges they are trying to solve within their organization. And they haven't done any form of benchmarking or measurement or made any progress even to determine that, hey, there are solutions made available via cloud native to address these things. And so a lot of companies are still expecting to be able to measure ROI without having anything to benchmark against. And uh, what we're trying to encourage folks as well is, since a lot of folks are in that kind of retrospective mode and trying to figure out ROI after the fact, um, the only way that we can really attack that, or, or, or one good way to attack that, is to maybe go evaluate and say, um, hey, uh, we, our main problem here is that we're unable to resolve issues quickly or allow multiple teams to work on a problem. So we need to go and measure and understand how much time does that take? What is the business impact? What does that look like? And if we already have something like Kubernetes in place, and we want to measure what's our ROI of Kubernetes, maybe we need to take the time and do some estimation and say, hey, if we didn't have Kubernetes, what would our implementation be? How would we attack that? How much would that cost us? Because uh, Kubernetes and cloud native technologies are a natural evolution born out of capabilities that are commonly needed across all industry, right? It's the next generation of how we develop and build business value or software. So if we can, uh, acknowledge the constraints that we would have if we didn't have Kubernetes in place and available, then maybe we can measure and benchmark how would we have done this without Kubernetes, and but because we have Kubernetes, what would that cost us now? And maybe that's a way to measure ROI. But I think that preemptive measurement is a huge challenge today still. Great. Anyone else would like to add something? I think one of the things we talk about in the cloud native um, maturity model is the messy middle. So the other thing to call out with ROI is that you're probably going to spend way more money uh, because you're going to be running your existing systems while you're transforming. And so if anybody goes into this as, hey, we're going to save money and our ROI is going to be immediate or it's going to be in six months or a year, you're probably wrong. So having those conversations and communicating those up and making sure everybody understands there's a messy middle where we're going to be spending more is super important. Okay, great. And so cloud native adoption requires quite a bit of a cultural and organizational shift. We know that. Um, and so how can um, leadership um, support their teams? So I think what's interesting with, uh, you know, with anything, right? All of you are working daily if, you know, a boss comes in and says, we're going to do something this way now, and you have to completely change how you're doing it. Like, there's resistance. It's like, wait a second, but I want to do it this way. I want to go over here, right? 
Um, cloud Native's the same way. So again, with our kind of preliminary results of our survey, we have a third of organizations that are saying, yeah, Cloud Native, we have changed our cultural focus at the organization, but there's a third that's like, yeah, no, there's no change. And so when you're going on this journey and you're thinking about the business value, you have to think about all of those um, kind of non-tangible results that you're gonna get, like, can you upskill people? Can you take them along with the journey? Can you um, really change the mind shift so that you're being more agile, being more scaled, getting all of the benefits of cloud native while the people are along the journey and they're not doing things just, you know, they're not resisting the change. Yeah, I think just to add on to that, um, there's, it's kind of a pull you know, methodology versus push. Um, so you know, bring people to the light right, of cloud native rather than forcing it upon them and then you know, watching them fail, um, which, which happens. Um, I think another thing is just being, uh, you know, I guess uh, Danielle kind of mentioned when you throw it over to your developers and expect them to figure it out but don't understand it yourself. So as you know, business leaders, or we recommend that business leaders really get well versed in some of this, uh, these technologies so that they can really see where they can, you know, uh, allocate their, you know, their budgets in, in appropriate ways rather than just dumping, you know, cash into a cloud native bucket, essentially. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I think it's, it's interesting. Um, as these waves of technologies come, we start to have kind of these, these, these beachheads or these things that we, uh, the, the, the business folks focus on as like enablement for capabilities. And today, the obvious elephant in the room is artificial intelligence, and the other one is the platform engineering side. And so a lot of companies kind of fixate on, hey, we need a platform team. Hey, we need these capabilities. And it's something they can perceive and it feels tangible. They, they know they're going to get some sort of value from it. Maybe they can work backwards. And uh, when we, uh, with the, the platform engineering maturity model and some of the maturity there, we try to direct people back down to the cloud native maturity model first and work backwards, because you need that end goal but there's a lot of work to be done in between. Um, and I mean, AI is causing that same trigger. Talking about AI and machine learning. Uh, so uh, adoption is skyrocketing. We see at conferences the most popular topic. So what role does cloud native play? Cloud native is absolutely, um, it's a core component of AI. We cannot do AI without cloud native. Um, cloud Native provides the, the scalability. The, it's able to deliver the non-functional requirements that AI requires if we consider AI as being application or effectively functionality. Now, there's a lot of fantastic engineering that is going into Kubernetes. Um, we've got um, dynamic resource allocation as a, as a good example. Um, but but uh, there's still going to be plenty of innovation there. I'm really looking forward to seeing how our solution designs, for example, for Kubernetes and the CNCF projects that support it, such as um, Kubeflow, evolve over time. Also, a really interesting aspect around AI is the sustainability side of this. Um, this is something that the, um, the um, TAG uh, environmental sustainability is looking at in depth and is in the process of drafting, for example, an AI white, white paper. So um, Cloud Native is really the only um, platform that we have and that we can engineer really to, to effectively support AI. Yeah, it's, it's all about scale. If you go, you know, listen to, if you look at the, just the history of, you know, l large language models, uh, every, it, the advancements come with scale. That's just the way it is. You need more and more um, compute power, uh, and and that's how we get you know the next version. It, it's it just is what it is. And and what we're really seeing is that um, you know AI is pushing the limits of of things like Kubernetes and, and cloud native um, concepts, and really kind of testing their limits. And at the same time, you know Kubernetes has to evolve. Um, to account for that, you know, so there we're going to see this kind of um, or we're, we are seeing a sort of a mutual, you know, impact and also advancement um, in, in, in both areas. Yeah, one uh, curveball question that I'm thinking of as we're talking about this. Um, would you guys say, so following the, the cloud native maturity model, right, would you think that 
companies that are at more advanced levels of cloud native maturity are more prepared or less prepared for AI? I think it's probably how they're using it. Um, maybe as a consumer, uh, there's maybe less risk, but if you're trying to you know, um, make advancements or build your own LLM, uh, I think you're gonna be much more prepared if you have a robust cloud native ecosystem. Well, and for those who haven't read the cloud native maturity model, there's five stages of it. And really we see it, you know, you're starting out, you're testing, that's level one. Level two is about you've moved into production with one application, um, maybe a few. Third is the messy middle that I mentioned where you're kind of made all these decisions because you were just trying it out and now you're like, oh, we need to actually make this work and scale and all of that. And then four is you're revisiting more of those decisions, but you're getting in the, the all the kind of security tooling and all the all the additional tooling you need and and stuff. And then in the fifth one, that's really where you're skyrocketing, right? You're um, adapted, you understand it, you're perhaps going back and moving more of your applications over, all of that. So the fifth one really gives you that scale and agility, and you've made decisions that make sense for your business. So I think if you have reached that level five maturity, you're really well placed for AI. The reality is, though, not a lot of people are there. Okay, great. And so what, and this is a question for everyone, uh, what advice would you give to everyone here, uh, no matter where they're at, at their journey? So I'm gonna kick off with, you have to understand why you have gone cloud native. And this is whether you're starting your transformation, whether you're in it, whether you feel like you're at the level five maturity. If you don't understand why you've done this, you need to align that why to the business problem you're trying to solve. And so loads of people are like, yes, this is cool technology, we wanna do this, we wanna play around, we wanna move here, but what does the business care about? What are those business goals that people are trying to address? And you should know that, even if you're the practitioner, you know, dealing with the code day in, day out, what does your boss care about? What does their boss care about? What is their boss's bosses? Like, what is the hierarchy so that you can truly deliver what the value is. And you can say, hey, I'm doing you know, this measurement of reducing downtime, and it actually is impacting our customer loyalty. And you can draw that line between the two things. Um, and we had a talk about it yesterday around platforms, maturity, the, the platform engineering, about similarly, like a platform, you need to understand the why. And just cloud native overall, understand your business problem. Anyone else? Um, so I'm going to suggest that you need to keep up the communication with your senior management. They do want to know what they're paying for because they're the ones who are funding the bills and they will always want to understand how the technology and the investment that, we're, that they are making is benefiting both their business and also their, their customers of the organization or the clients. Also consider that customers are, not, are also internal, so there may be non-technical groups such as a sales division or um, a legal division, for example, that is relying on, on those systems. That's absolutely critical. Um, keep your communication regular and keep it short. If you can't explain what you're doing on two slides, then it might be time to, again, look at refining the, the key message that you want to continue communicating, because keeping up that support's important. And then um, and another thing that I would probably suggest as well and is make sure that you can also contribute to the um, community as well. And I'm going to make a real shout out here, actually, to, um, w to provide input into the CNCF um, and into the projects. Now there's technical contributions, but there are also non-technical contributions, which are really important. And we really need those in order to go and drive forward the, the business value that Cloud Native offers. So, you know, I'm gonna invite everybody to contribute here or to other, other working groups as well within the CNCF. Yeah, I just would echo that and, and say that, you know, uh, it may feel, uh, you may feel like an imposter uh, to, you know, contribute in, in some group, but I'll, I'll tell you this, at least from my experience, you know, 
you will feel like an imposter, and that's okay. That's okay. Get involved um, with with something technical or non-technical. Um, you know, come back to to KubeCon, but but don't let KubeCon be the only um, you know uh, uh, interaction with the CNCF that you have. Yeah, one of the big challenges that we see too is, and, and we're talking a lot about communicating upwards, right? And telling people what's going on. I, I think there's a big gap in the business value space right now of um, either people talking downwards, right, and asking your developers, your technologists, like, what challenges are you facing? Where can we provide investment? How can we help? Uh, we need guidance and uh, vision and support um, and even mandates from the top down to help drive adoption and in interdepartmental communication, as well as help us understand um, and surface challenges and problems that by tackling those do provide that business value. And I think too often we're still expecting our technical teams to just go figure it out and make the magic happen. But we need a, a stronger level of engagement from the top down. And, and ideally it will work to a point where it's champion, right? Where you feel supported and you're, begin, you're being given the resources that you need. But that does come from executive mandates and a conscious investment in these initiatives. Well, and you're probably going to see a lot of booths if you go around the, sh the solution showcase saying, like, we're accelerating your journey. Um, and that's because when, you, when you're thinking through, well, what does this really do? You know, if I'm building a platform or whatever technology, it's about what am I, what am I trying to get out into the world? I'm trying to get my customers, whether they're internal customers or external customers, using an application and I want it to be reliable, and I want it to scale, and I want it to do all those things. And the end goal is, well, we're accelerating that. So, you know, while you're going around the booths and you see that, just know, like, that could be what the business needs. Obviously, the technology to get you there is what you're here to evaluate. Great. Uh, and so let's talk about tools. Uh, and we talked about it already, but what tools are available? So, uh, because we are members of the Cartographus Working Group, we did write the Cloud Native Maturity Model. So we authored it in 2021, but continued to keep it updated. Um, we've been doing a big push uh, lately around incorporating AI into the model, uh, or the maturity model. Last year, we released a version three, which was all about the business values, where we have different use cases and associated KPIs with those use cases that people can use as they are looking to figure out how do you communicate the business value of this platform. Um, so that's one. We also have the platform maturity model. Yeah, the, uh, the platforms working group has put together a platform white paper, right, to help you understand what uh, kind of moves and shakes and, and how a platform needs to be assembled. There are other questions and things that are growing out of that. But one of the most useful pieces that grew out of that was the ability to self-assess against uh, a maturity model. And uh, what we did, and it's important to highlight, is that this model is complementary to others. Um, your platform engineering strategy is a result of your understanding of the business value and your need to productize your internal IT. It doesn't remove the need to go through the other uh, through the other maturity models, and the cloud native maturity model for us is critical when we start there before deciding is a platform even right for me? Do I need to go down that road? But if you have determined that that is the right path for you, then the platform maturity model is very strong, um, and we're also working on a platform maturity assessment to help you have a better understanding of where do you fall in that model. Um, as well as how do you align with other industries and other companies that are going through the same journey and what challenges are they facing in common with yours? Great, and how can the maturity model evolve to help organizations drive business goals beyond technology? So the maturity model doesn't cover, it doesn't give you the ins and outs of each technology you need to use. It covers things like your people, your process, your policy, all the different areas of your business that Cloud Native is going to touch. And so using it as a way to go, I need to consider these things as I move through maturity is really important. And it's a tool that you can use, but it's also a tool you can give to your higher ups in the organization to read and, and understand because it will help you when you're looking for resource and budget and time and all of that. 
Yeah, and then how do you, um, working groups collaborate to basically show the business value? Because we have a few here. I can talk, I can make a comment about that. Um, when when uh, kind of my first entry into uh, the CNCF really was through platform engineering and uh, getting involved in that community. But the, the questions that we were trying to answer, even for ourselves, for customers we support and for others, um, the platform guidelines and definition didn't help us work into the business value overall. It was a technology we could implement, it was a strategy, and we know that that has evolved, but we needed to tell a broader story. And so we, when I found and was a consumer of the cloud native maturity model, it was incredibly useful to me to try to go build a bridge and collaborate. And so the, the, the working groups are very, very open and they want your feedback and they need collaboration beyond code contribution. And so the ability to have discussions across the group and jump into the, the Slack and, and ask some things and get some help has been uh, critical because in the platforms working group, we can't answer all of your questions, nor should we. In the same way that one product shouldn't rule them all. And so by having cross-group uh, cross collaboration, it lets us, it lets each group have a greater and deeper focus in that purpose for that model and help uh, guide consumers to the right place at the right time. And that's so critically important to me as a consumer with Cartographos is understanding how do we identify where I need to go to get more information and deeper information so I can build that strategy. Well, and Simon's been working very closely with the AI working group. I'm going to plug. I'm going to plug you to yeah. say that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So um, we attempt to work across the CNCF, across all of the different groups. I mentioned um, TAG, Environmental Sustainability, and also the AI working group, which is part of TAG Runtime. So we really want to make sure that the work that we're producing is relevant and current, and attempts to be um, to touch on all parts of the, the cloud native ecosystem. We're really excited about the um, work that we're doing at the moment, and we really hope to get version 4 prepared and out in time for KubeCon EU 2025 in London. Come see us there. Well, and I want to make one more plug, which is when you are talking to people this week and they're talking about their CNCF project or they're talking about their technology, and you're like, that's a really cool technology, I want to tell my boss about it, before you do that, ask them like, what value that's going to actually deliver the business. And just ask that question because it's going to help you get better versed at what are those things that you need to consider when you're talking and trying to get people to invest in resources and projects and you know, software. Great. I think those were the questions we wanted to cover. So um, you, you've seen uh, we ha added a few resources here, so please um, check them out and also participate in the survey. Um, because uh, the team needs uh, your support. And so we are open for Q&A. Okay, so I think, are there mics for the, because we want to make? Do I need a mic? Yes, because, yeah. yeah. Um, so I have a question about, I just feel weird standing up, can I sit down? Okay. <laughs> um, so I have a question about um, how to approach this. My company is just now starting that observability journey and it's everything all at once, literally. So I'm focused on observability, but we're still trying to help people understand why observability is important in addition to monitoring, and we're having lots and lots of challenges. So I was just wondering, like, how do you approach this within your organizations? Like, any, anything you want to share could be helpful. I mean, my first question back to you would be, well, who said you were going to do it? And why did they say you were going to do it? And, you know, right? And so as you're going through it, it's like, okay, there's challenges to understanding it, but Somebody said we needed to do this. And why did they believe that? And who were they talking to with that decision coming down? Um, and then I think it's about yeah, understanding that why, and maybe over to you for more information. Yeah, I'm gonna ask, what value will this give us? So how is this gonna help us respond to our customers better? If, in the case of observability, if we're able to demonstrate that we can service requests much faster, we can keep up our 
customer retention, for example. People are buying more because they can get a web page rendered quickly, for example. That's real uh, uh, major help. So, it, so it, perhaps uh, look outside the walls of the technical organization and perhaps even the company itself and tie it right back to what we're delivering to our end users. That can really help to go and set, set priorities and I, I, it's a technique I've used and it, it works great. I'd take a, a, an aggressive approach and I'd say, how much time are you wasting not having the tools that you need? Measure that, quantify that, show how much that costs and what you think you can get it down to. Yeah, I think, uh, I guess, you know, there's the guidance of measure everything, but then it's like, well, we have to actually prioritize something, right? Because, you know, if we measure just everything, we're just going to blow up our, our, you know, log buckets and not know what to do with it. Because now, you know, we have a bunch of logs, but okay, we have to search through them. Are they indexed? Uh, yada, yada. So I think it's um, having those goals in mind first um, so that we have you know, kind of an idea of what to measure is super helpful. Um, there is the risk of like, well, something went wrong. We don't have that information. We have to go back and, and do it. So I don't know. It's, a, it's definitely there's a balancing act um, that, that, you know, monitoring kind of goes that extra level of like, not only are you capturing everything, but you're also like trying to respond to that. And I think that that can be, you know, super noisy if you turn everything on as an alert, right? So it, it's definitely something where you, you know, it's more of an art than a science, that's for sure. Um, and every organization is going to be different, so. Question back there. Oh, oh, there's a question there and a question there. There's two questions. Whoever grabbed the mic. He's got a mic. So. I'll go. Uh, so my firm is in the geographic information space. We're market leaders in geographic um, analytics, spatial analytics, imagery recognition, and so forth. Um, a few years ago, we released a cloud-native uh, architecture for our software delivered to customers to manage in their own environment. I think that's fairly unique in this space. Uh, Robbie, your comment about push versus pull resonated. A lot of our customers come to us because they're mandated to move to cloud native due to the executive order and other things that have happened in this country and elsewhere, and yet they're clearly not ready, and it's an awkward conversation because we sell them software they want to buy, and they may not be ready for it. So my question is, where have you found evaluations done effectively for customers that know they need to move to cloud native, may not be ready for it, may not be ready for someone to tell them they're not ready for it? and trying to guide them in that conversation. Yeah, I think um, I, I don't know how best to approach that. I haven't encountered it in that way. Um, but I think, you know, there's definitely, a, um, uh, that's a very real challenge that, that everywhere, I think a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of organizations are facing. Um, and to be in that position of, you know, kind of, you're trying to provide the service, but you also are trying to teach the service. Um, I think, you know, without giving a lot of away for free, how do you do that? Uh, I think that it's, it's a, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, that you can maybe draw from other experiences, turn them into case studies, and then use that, perhaps. Um, uh, do you maybe have any other advice? You know, I think the big thing is, like, do you have an advocate within the organization that's seen value and getting that person, you know, you almost have to run it as its own marketing department of the technology. Like who's advocating for this? Who, what is, what are the KPIs that we're seeing? Are you making the job better? Is it easier? All of those things and being able to demonstrate that so that your people are going, Oh, I'm excited about that versus like, oh, you're just telling me to use this and I don't want to. Yeah, there's a, and I want to, he's got a question back there in the back too. He's been waving his arm. Yeah, you know, next. The, um, <laughs> he's really enthusiastic. The, um, uh, uh, the, a lot of the conversation that we have when we do platforms is about uh, the build versus buy argument, right? It's like, do we go get something or do we build it ourselves? Which part of it do we build ourselves? And um, I, I think in a, a situation where you have a commercial product where you need to knock down and do objection handling and get capabilities out of the way so that they can actually buy your stuff um, is, is an interesting case. And that's why I think, uh, I wish we hadn't gone to SaaS and then seen this pullback where now we have to get our SaaS product in somebody's environment, but that's the new reality. 
Um, and, uh, but going back to build versus buy, I think there is an element of, uh, we need to make our things consumable, so maybe we can find a way to allow our customer to buy and then build. And so I think having elements or at least partnerships on the platform side to ship a platform that can host our software to enable that transaction to happen is very important as well. But that's what that vendor floor is great for, channel relationships and partnerships, and cloud native is interoperability. So hopefully we're in the right environment for that. Yeah. I don't know how to use one of these, so I'm going to try. So, uh, so my question is, the biggest problem that I think maybe all of us have is, is not only identifying you know, the, the kind of intangibles about why a project wants to move forward, but are there any tools that have helped you or you've seen and used to help kind of derive the metrics for demonstrating the value of change? Dora, space. Right. Find a measurement framework that works for you but is still attainable and accessible. Um, I, I, I think the, the measurement frameworks are great as well, but they also are perilous because some companies want to just go to the ends of the earth and measure, measure everything. But you have to start by measuring something you can actually measure and start small. Um, so I think identifying a framework as a guideline is something that you can push towards and build your measurement maturity towards. Um, and then start small and find, set yourself on the path. But you need to find a measurement um, that fits your organization's capability as well as what your internal folks care about. And I really like Dora, but don't treat it as the, the rule book for everything. But it cares about your people, and it starts to highlight the business value of supporting your people, right, and preventing burnout and some things there. Um, you may not initially be ready for that, though. So find some of the submetrics that align with your org and are attainable, and then progress through in advance and take advantage of more of the framework as you go. OK, and we need to wrap up. So thanks, everyone. Uh, please let us know how we did, and thanks for coming. Thank you. Bye-bye.